It is fantastic to see so many of you in the room, and we look forward to tonight uh, as the 2019 Lake County Town Hall meeting. My name is Chris Dawson. I'll be your moderator for the evening, and we're going to jump right into the programming. So I'm going to ask Representative Hay to open us up in prayer, followed by Representative Sullivan to open us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to serve, and we thank you for the opportunity to listen. We ask that you guide and direct us through this course of the, of the evening. Watch over us and bless us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you very much. Again, my name is Chris Dawson. I'll be your moderator for this evening. I'd also like to recognize Matthew McClain, who's going to be our timekeeper for the evening. And real quick, before we begin with questions, I'll go through the rules and guidelines for our town hall tonight. We'll begin the presentation with opening statements. Each legislator will have four minutes to discuss uh, yourself, your district, and tell us a little bit about your efforts in the 2019 legislative session. Following that, we will proceed to questions. Our questions tonight are from the audience, and so on your way in, uh, you likely saw on the table that there are cards for you to fill out. If you did not, there are cards in the back of the room, and we ask that you do fill those out if you'd like to uh, put a question forward this evening. The questions are going to be taken up in the order that they are received, and uh, if you have not had an opportunity to fill out that form, please go ahead and make your way to the back now, or raise your hand, and we'll be happy to bring one to you. Once I read each question, uh, there will be five minutes total for response, legislators. Uh, we're going to just allow you to raise your hand if you would like to respond to a question, or if it's directed to an individual legislator, I will make that uh, clear at the beginning. The first respondent will have up to three minutes to respond, and then if an additional respondent would like to chime in, that will be an additional two minutes. So again, each question will be capped at five minutes. Uh, for the audience, all questions will be read, and I, again, we'll read the questions uh, out loud. In the case of a duplicate question, I will call it as a duplicate and indicate that a response has already been provided on that specific question, and then we will proceed to the next question. If you have any questions related to uh, a question that you submitted, please see the fine folks in the back of the room, and they will help you. Uh, if you feel like I have called a question duplicate, perhaps it was not, they will assist you with that, and we will correct it. At the end, we do want to have a few minutes for our legislators to provide closing thoughts and uh, to wrap up the presentation. And finally, in, in writing your questions and in tonight's proceedings, we ask everyone, of course, to use respectful language and maintain decorum. And speaking of decorum, first and foremost, please take out your cellular phone and silence it at this time. Additionally, of course, tonight we're going to be having substantive discussions of policy, and we just ask that everyone be respectful of differences of opinion. Any excessive speaking, yelling, or other disruptive behavior will not be tolerated, and uh, you may be asked to leave the room. I think we've got a pretty uh, good audience here tonight. We're not worried about that, but just to put it on the record. So with that, again, one more time, the process for submitting a question. There's a form in the back of the room. Please see one of our assistants there, and they will guide you through the process if you have any questions. And with that, legislators, with your permission, we'll begin. So question number one is from Nancy Hurlburt. The question is... Oh, correct. Yes. Thank you all for keeping me honest. Legislators, we're going to start with your introductions, and we'll go to Senator Baxley to kick us off. Well, thank you. And thank all of you for coming. This, this is the most exciting time of service for me is when you get to come back from session and dialogue with real people and how things hit the ground. And it's actually a very busy time and a wonderful time to touch the real people that you serve. I want you to remember, uh, I, I'm not the government. I am your senator and representative of the legislature to go and speak to the government on your behalf and try to shape its future. And so I take very seriously this time, and I appreciate that you've put so much trust in me. Uh, I was elected uh, in 16 as your senator, and again in 
20, 18, excuse me. Uh, I now actually will be serving a real four-year term, so I'm not on the 20 ballot, but I will be up in 22. I can run one more time. Uh, the Senate District, Senate 12, uh, involves Marion County, Lake County, and all of Sumter County. So it's a very diverse population of people from different, but just like Florida. It's a picture of Florida, people from all over the world, all over the country, that come to Florida. And I want to report to you that I think after this session, this is probably one of the smoothest sessions we've run. They're always challenging because you have very different perspectives from all over this state and all over your district. And that's okay. This dialogue is healthy if we do it in a healthy way. And what I'm excited about is that we're leading the country right now in financial stability as a state because of the kind of leadership that you've been sending to Tallahassee. We, in spite of the hurricanes that we got involved with and the disasters that have to be funded, uh, we actually still uh, have rebuilt a, a healthy reserve. We've seen growth in revenues with low taxes. We have over a thousand people a day move to Florida because of the favorable climate. We live, work, enjoy the real climate, and to grow a business or raise a family or to retire and contribute those things that you can through a new. You know, I learned I'm 67 this year, so I I learned very quickly. Uh, I don't think retirement is difficult. You just uh, regear and you get to do new things that you really care about and love. Uh, Jeanette and I have been married 46 years, on September the 1st, be 47, and uh, she's an immigrant. She's a French-Canadian came here with some of her family, became a citizen soon after we were married. Uh, I'm an old fifth generation Florida country boy, so it's what Florida is, where all these different things can come together. What we share it is a love, and my desire is to protect these things, faith, family, freedom, opportunity, and life itself. And if we protect those things, it's amazing what the private sector can accomplish. And if we support and encourage them and work with them, we have a great relationship with all of our local officials. Uh, we try very hard to fit things together. But I will tell you, there was a concerted effort by the president, the governor, and the speaker to collaborate so that we built a future together. And it's even bipartisan. Every senator voted together across party lines for the budget that we gave to Florida. And that is the only bill we have to pass. Thank you for letting me serve. Well, good evening. My name is Jennifer Sullivan. I represent House District 31, which includes where we are right now. Um, so to just share a little bit more about the geography of the district, so I have portions of Orange County, almost all of Apopka, and then moving into Sorrento, Mount Dora, Tavares, a little bit of Leesburg, and then all the way up towards the Marion County line, Umatilla, and Astor. I was elected in 2014, so I'm currently serving my third term. Thank you for electing me subsequently. And this year, going into session, I had the privilege of serving as your education chair in the Florida House. So underneath me were three subcommittees. We have education quality, education innovation, and career and college readiness. And so this year, I had the opportunity to lead in that silo. And some of the things that we worked on were hand-in-hand -hand with the Senate and also our new governor in DeSantis. And I will say it was very different because when I was elected four years ago, um, Governor Scott had already been there for a few years. And so working under a new uh, gubernatorial administration was really exciting and also eager to get things done, which I think we saw in the aggressiveness of having a unified budget. And one of those big things was our water projects. Almost $70 million went into the Everglades project as well as multiple uh, hundreds of other millions of dollars into water projects across the state. One of which I was working on in Umatilla that we didn't get funded this year, but I will continue to work on. Two of the bills that I wanted to speak to, one had to do with a family empowerment scholarship um, that I sponsored, and that had to do with letting families have more choice in education, and I think we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that, but it's one of the campaign commitments that I made, and so I was happy to have the opportunity to follow through on that commitment. Um, I don't think that students should be bound by their zip codes. I think parents know what's best for students, not a government, and so I'm excited that that scholarship 
um, helps the working class families as low as prioritizing um, those in a low income situation to be able to have true choice in education. And amongst our public schools that often can get overlooked in the conversation, um, their transportation voucher was a part of that package. So if you do have the opportunity to go to a different school across your district, but you wouldn't be able to afford the transportation to send your child there, we now offer scholarships for those tra transportation. So that's to help have more choice in our public education as well. I also sponsored um, Senate Bill 730, um, and that had to do with school safety, and um, that was in response to, as we all know, the tragic shooting that happened last year in Parkland, um, and we put together the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas um, Advisory Council, and that council met and then came before the Education Committee and gave their recommendations. Um, it was a bipartisan effort with bipartisan recommendations, and we worked with the Senate to fully adopt all of those. Um, and again, I think we'll have an opportunity to go in more detail about those with questions, but one of the big um, effects of that bill was for mental health funding, as well as better communication between schools when students transfer from school to school to make sure they're getting the continuation of the care that they need, which is very important. And so, in regards to um, Lake County, one of the projects that we were able to bring back um, $500,000 for that I had the honor to work with Representative Hank with was for uh, Construction Academy in Eustis High School. We had one that I worked on last year that had to do with Leesburg High School that's having its groundbreaking at the end of this month that we're really excited to partner with businesses and the chambers for those opportunities for our students. And so we had the opportunity to work out that as well. So I just want to thank everybody for coming out here tonight, for being engaged in this process. And iron sharpens iron, and differing ideas helps the overall product. And so I really appreciate you being involved and taking the time out of your evening, especially with the first week of school. We did it so people would be back in town, and it looks like people are. So looking forward to the conversation tonight and getting to hear your concerns. Well, good evening. My name is Brett Haig, and I represent District 33 which is a small portion of Lake County up on the north side there, Fruitland Park. I also represent all of Sumter County and a small portion of Marion County. So I'm honored to be here. I'm thankful to be here. And I'll just tell you I'm a very conservative young man, and I look at things analytically, and I look at things from a business perspective. So my mind is driven around that. When I went to Tallahassee, I passed three bills off the floor of the House. Uh, one was a protective injunctions bill, one was an off-highway vehicles bill, a safety bill, and the third one was a legislative review of a legislative process or, or proposed regulations of unregulated functions. It's a mouthful, but it's basically standard operating procedures in a business for the state to follow and the benefit of, for the benefit of the people. I don't believe in more government. I believe in less government. And I'm taking my approach in Tallahassee to play defense. I'm not going to grade myself or come back here and speak to you folks on what I accomplished or what I achieved because my hope is that I play defense and that I'm able to block legislation that I don't feel is necessary. Now, I'm proud of the three bills that I passed, absolutely, and I got to partner with Representative Sullivan on the Elevate Lake project, which I was really so thankful to be a part of. And I, and I passed a small appropriations bill for the city of Wildwood uh, for a water line that they desperately need uh, for that city. But know this about me is that my whole approach is merely to protect the freedoms in which we have today and try to defend it. Legislation will come along for us to pass that will enhance those lifestyles and I want to be a part of it. But when I see legislation that just doesn't make sense, then I feel like the, the need for defense is in order. So. With that said, I'm thankful to be here tonight, and I look forward to, to spending some time with you guys. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Anthony Sabatini. I'm your state representative for District 32. I represent two-thirds of Lake County, everything in the south, southern and middle part of the county. I've lived here in Lake County nearly my whole life, and serving in the House is the second highest honor of my life. The highest is serving in the Florida Army National Guard. Uh, and so, just really proud to be able to serve you guys. Uh, passed uh, four bills in the uh, Florida House this year, two that were signed by the governor, made it through the Senate, signed by the governor, and uh, got some good appropriations bills. My focus in Tallahassee, uh, much like my great colleague, Representative Haig here, is less government, less taxes. Um, I believe in people. I believe people know how to fix their problems. They know how to fix uh, 
uh, their lives and they know how to get ahead and they know what's best for themselves. And so what we need to do is get government out of the way and, and enable people, whether it be economic opportunity, educational opportunity, uh, and just freedom in general. I'm looking forward to your questions. So uh, thank you very much for coming out here tonight. Having an active citizenry is one of the things I'm most proud about living in Lake County. When I got out of college and was working and living around the country, I decided I really wanted to come back to Lake County because it was a true sense of community. And the volunteerism and citizenry you see here is unreplicated anywhere else. I've never lived anywhere else where you see so many people involved in the community at so many different levels. And so I want to just uh, say thank you for that. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to tonight. Well, thank you, legislators. Okay, now to the part that I was so excited to get to that I jumped the gun. We'll get back to our questions. Real quick, for anyone who has joined us perhaps in the last couple minutes, uh, we are still taking questions from the audience. There's a form to fill out in the back of the room, uh, and the questions are being taken up in the order that they are received. So with that, and without further ado, we'll start with our first question. From Nancy Hurlbert, uh, to each legislator, how many bills did each of you file, and how many were signed into law by the governor? Well, contrary to my wonderful House members, Senators can file as many as they want to. Down the House, they get such a big crowd, they limit them to six bills. And uh, I've worked down there in the House. Uh, it's a great place to work. And, uh, but the Senate, 40 people, runs a little different. To answer your question, I, I filed 43 bills. 23% of those were passed or as standalones or were part of another bill. Uh, a lot of the bills that I filed that did not, they also serve a great purpose. If you enter to introduce a bill or an amendment, you will get a discussion, and you will put Florida in that discussion. And that's the purpose of some bills. And then we'll see where they go. Some of them mature. So, but that was the odds on. As you can see, I also kill a lot more bills than I pass. Uh, the average passage is about 10%, because we'll look at about 3,500 bills, and uh, we'll pass less than 200. So we are trying to give you as much freedom as possible. Some things sound great, but then when you look at all the unintended outcomes that may occur, often the juice is not worth the squeeze. Thank you. I did not file any individual member bills this year. As chair of education, I focused on my committee responsibilities, but I did carry two of our committee bills, and that was the school safety bill in response to the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas recommendations, as well as the family empowerment scholarship bill that got rolled into the broader Senate project, uh, Senate bill um, that included the best and brightest and um, GKT, general knowledge test for teachers, amongst other things. So those were the two big policy packages that I personally carried, and I had gotten two of my appropriation project through the House and Senate. Unfortunately, the governor vetoed them, but the project that I did work with Representative Hay on that I mentioned, that one we did get. So I filed six. I passed three off the floor of the House. Two were signed by the governor, and those are all... Um, those were just my normal bills, and then my appropriations bills, I filed, filed five, and then the city of Wildwood, and then Elevate Lake with uh, Representative Sullivan passed. Uh, thank you. I had uh, filed six bills, six policy bills. Uh, three of those made through the House. I also carried a committee bill, so technically four, but one was given to me from the committee. It stemmed from a committee on, on which I sat. Uh, passed three or four appropriation bills, two of them got uh, vetoed by the governor. That's very common in the governor's first year in Tallahassee to uh, veto more than average. And so one of those was for Lake Sumter. I plan on filing that again. we got to make sure we have a secure Lake Sumter State College campus. Um, and then I just want to say one brief thing about the, the nature of the subject. A lot of the bills you'll file will get written into another bill that will get across the finish line. So technically you didn't pass that bill, even though the substance got across it. And then sometimes, and you talk to anybody who's experienced in Tallahassee, they'll tell you a lot of the most influential stuff you'll do there is not actually filing and passing a bill, but influencing the way a bill will look like. And uh, I can say that my very esteemed colleagues on the other side of this table over here have a lot of influence in Tallahassee. And so if you ask them specifically one-on-one -on -one, some of the things they've done to influence policy in Tallahassee, it's, it's bigger than just 
filing and passing one bill. I know that uh, Senator Baxley and Rep. Tim Sullivan are very good at that. Okay, our next question comes from Kim Norbert. A little bit of a lead in, legislators, and then a question. Uh, over 3,000 Floridians commit suicide every year. 50% of them use a gun. This includes nearly 400 Florida veterans. Mass shooters often display warning signs before committing acts of violence. Red flag laws empower law enforcement and immediate family members to petition a court for an extreme risk protection order which will temporarily restrict a person's access to guns when they pose a danger to themselves or others. President Trump supports red flag laws, as do Senators Rubio and Scott. The citizens of Lake County want to be safe and ask that you support red flag, excuse me, red flag laws as well. Will you commit to supporting red flag laws in Florida? So we have red flag laws in Florida. I'm completely and totally against them in every sense of the word. They violate the Second Amendment. They violate the Fourth Amendment. They make us less safe. If you look at the 18 states that have red flag laws, you'll see there is absolutely no difference in preventing crime. They are what I call a soundbite solution. You file them, they look, they, they look good on paper. They have zero effect over human behavior. Worst of all, it's a dangerous trend of lawmaking that we're going into when we create these red flag bills. If you've ever seen the film Minority Report from 2002, the subject of the film is they were trying to prevent pre-crime. And that's what these red flag laws do. We're trying to prevent pre-crime and we're essentially punishing people before they do anything based on maybe symbols of behavior. I think that's a really bad uh, piece of law, uh, trend in lawmaking and I think we need to respect people's full process, due process rights. And in terms of answering the gun issue, and suicide issue and these sorts of very, very complex and tangible issues, we need to focus on mental health. I fully and totally support uh, when it comes to uh, funding, allocations, creating community programs, outreach, public outreach, in order to prevent and allow for access of uh, mental health in Florida. I think we could do a better job of that in Florida. But the distraction that the media has created with gun laws is, I think, uh, uh, just really, really sadly unfortunate. Uh, because it, it's substituting a real conversation about mental health with a conversation about guns. And uh, it really fulfills an agenda based on an irrational hatred of guns on behalf of so many people. And I think that's sad. Representative Sullivan for a follow up. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Representative Sullivan. Thank you. Um, well, I would have a different perspective, though I greatly respect my colleague in the House. So I do believe that there are versions of the red flag law that are warranted, and I did support the bill last year that we passed that had aspects of that um, as part of the response to the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. And I do think that if someone, um, if people around them who love them um, feel as though that they pose a threat to themselves or others, I do think that there is a place, especially considering it has to be backed up by law enforcement, to establish that threat for the, the uh, guns to be taken for a time. However, I think what's so important is that there's also a due process to petition the court for that. And so there's a way to get those back, and I think it's a protective measure. I think what's really important, though, is to know, and I, I don't believe that it goes against the Constitution. That's something that's very important to me. I personally have my concealed carry license, and I've personally gone through multiple different trainings to be able to carry a firearm and use it responsibly. Um, and I think that that's very important. I think that we need to take some of the fear out of the conversation because I think there are genuinely a lot of people who fear weapons because they don't understand them or have never held one or don't understand the intended use. And so I think my heart definitely goes out compassionately for where that fear is coming from. And I think we need to do a better job of making people aware. Um, however, I do think that there is a place for it. I also strongly believe in funding um, mental health to a greater extent, and that's something I specifically work very hard at in education space because I think it starts with our students even at a young age um, and that's important to make sure that we're um, meeting them where they're at early on and being able to have conversations I think especially in an age of social media where oftentimes people um, can be uh, bullied and there's such hateful things said and the effect that that can have on young people the effect it can even have on elected officials I know I've um, certainly experienced it a lot of myself and I think it's um, a societal issue that we need to go back to recognizing that people have value, that though they may differ, we need to respect those opinions and be willing to have a conversation as a whole. And this is an example. Sure, I'm on addressing it. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't commit to any bill without knowing what the bill says. 
you clearly have their own adequate protections. You can't support a bill that takes away the rights of innocent people who are doing nothing wrong simply because we have a fear factor at work. Also, we do have Baker Act, the Marshman Act, uh, so that we can examine people who we feel are a threat to themselves or others. But the misuse of this is very fragile. I would be extremely cautious about considering it. What people don't realize is <coughs> we have a 47-year low in the crime in the state of Florida. We have a consistent record of supporting the view that law-abiding people should be empowered to stop violent acts against themselves and others, and that they often prevent violent acts from occurring. So we want to be very careful. There are very few things that are actually a constitutional right. Don't ship a fire on this. Thank you. So my position on on the red flag laws is I would need to completely understand the bill, just like the senator said. I believe in the Second Amendment. I have a concealed weapons permit. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about guns. Mental health is a big issue. But I couldn't commit to saying yes or no until I understand the bill. Because the bills are complex, they're wordy, and you have to study them to completely understand them. So that's kind of where I'm at on that. Thank you. Okay, our next question comes from Deanna Dean. Uh, to all legislators, will you support Medicaid expansion? I can start. Um, I would not support Medicaid expansion, and I have voted to not support it in 2014. Um, it came up for a vote, and we had a very lengthy debate. I think it was actually over 10 hours in the House. Um, so there are a lot of different perspectives inside heard. I do think that we need affordable health care. I think it's a big issue. It takes up over 40% of Florida's entire budget. And so I don't think that Medicaid expansion is sustainable or a long-term solution, and therefore I don't support it. Um, I have been consistently against expanding Medicare for a number of reasons. One is I have foster kids, uh, and when I first got them, that, and they became adopted kids. Um, I think Medicaid's a terrible system. I wouldn't use any of the doctors that were on there. I paid for their care out of my pocket. I don't think Medicaid is a good system. I think it's a failed system, and I would not like to expand it. There are better answers to make sure that people have health care. Uh, the expansion of our kid care insurance program has been fantastic. Um, encouraging people not to work and to not find their own way in life, but to become dependents is not is cutting them off from really discovering what's there for them that's much better. In addition to that, we're exposing this state to an un to a future liability that is just unrealistic. And uh, for all those reasons, I don't think that's the path forward. We do have compassionate conservatives. We are building programs that will cover these people and help these people that need help, that are truly uh, against hardship. And uh, I think there are better ways than the Medicaid program that's presently being offered and would not expand it. Thank you. Uh, I'm against it. Yes, I also agree. I, I would like to reiterate their comments. I'm against it. Uh, and I just want to add one note, which is I'm extremely proud to serve, a, I think, a really exciting and epic time period in the history of the Florida House of Representatives. We have amazing senior leadership of which Representative Sullivan is a part. And with the sole focus of the House this last session was reducing the cost of health care in Florida. Extremely bold, intelligent bill making uh, and passing. It was a, a very bold agenda. Uh, I can name four or five different bills that are, will have a significant and immediate uh, change to the cost of health care. The delivery of health care is a massive issue. Before we talk about expanding Medicare or anything like that, which I'm already against, we have to make sure that this, these medical operations are affordable. Uh, unfortunately, there was a monopoly of hospitals and, and folks in the healthcare industry that are controlling the cost. And so I'm just very proud to take part in what I consider a bipartisan effort in the House to reduce the cost of health care. Next question comes from Catherine Williamson. 
64.5% of voters approved Amendment 4 in 2018. Six months later, you changed what was passed and limited the number of citizens who could reclaim their right to vote. Estimates are that 80% are now not eligible. Explain why your will is more important than the will of Florida voters. Thank you. Uh, well, you can point to me on that one because uh, I chair uh, elections and uh, ethics and elections. And the, the answer, quite frankly, is it was what do we need to do to abide by the Constitution? If you read the Constitutional Amendment, it clearly uses the word completion of your sentence. Now, if they wanted to run an amendment that said completion of your time served, our incarceration, that's a different statement. We have convicted felons who have never been incarcerated, who in fact negotiated a police settlement for either to be on probation and pay restitution or pay fees that, that they owed. Um, I can't separate for you that that's part of the sentence. Uh, I'm very pleased with the effort that was carried out in the sense that we did need a meaningful path back for people who restored it. I've been in over 20 prisons. I'm a big advocate for doing everything we can to restore people. And I believe many of them can and will be restored. But at the same time, I believe in holding people accountable. And you simply cannot walk away from your sentence and say you've abided by the Constitution. Now, what I favor is a clearinghouse so that people can challenge whether they're eligible or not, and so they can see the fact pattern. But this takes some coordination by the State Department between what Department of Corrections knows, what the sentencing says from the courts, and then giving the supervisors and the citizens a legitimate source to go to and find out if they're eligible. Otherwise, you're asking to commit another felony and that they claim they're eligible when they may not be because they thought they were. So I want clarity in that process. And I also feel like that we have to comply with the Constitution. That's why we just won the lawsuit. Okay. We move on to our next question. Uh, next question is from Mady Melvin, uh, specifically for Representative Hayes. Will you support the constitutional amendment banning assault weapons? Moving on to our next question, from Will Morgan. Does the Royal Palm Express train company have a specific schedule when the horn blows? Or is there any way for these hours to be regulated more closely? It sounds like a local issue. I'll repeat the question. Does the Royal Palm Express train company have a specific schedule when the horn blows? Or is there any way for there to be regulation of these hours? I do want to answer, even though this is clearly a local issue. Because I was a city commissioner at uses for two years, and we uh, dealt with the issue. And I'm going to out the fact that one of our city managers from the Gold Triangles here in the room, and he'll have an adequate answer, Mr. John Drury. But I believe federal law actually preempts any regulation on this. And so that, that train is actually regulated by federal statute. Please find me after this meeting, and I'll get you in touch with the people that you need to get the answer. Thank you, Representative. Today's question comes from Patricia, Patricia Spear, and it's for Senator Baxley. Of the 40-plus bills you sponsored during the last legislative session, which, if any, will you submit again to try to gain passage? Which is your highest priority for the next legislative session? Uh, I would tell you that that process is still at work. We're still in a listing mode. It's a long time. To, you can't file bills after session begins. But until then, you can um, some of those bills I won't file again. Some of them uh, I feel like we presented for conversation and there'll be a different approach or a different way. You also have to think about timing. This year is going to be very shattered by the 2020 election. And uh, there's just a lot of subjects that are going to be very distracted by that impact. And so you think about timing. I will tell you that one that I was disappointed that Representative Hague and I worked on is I want to do something about the elder abuse with scammers coming by and collecting $1,500 to start a project and disappearing. Uh, we didn't have that bill just right probably this time and it became a fear factor with legitimate uh, players in the construction industry. 
but we're going to zero in on most of it is unlicensed practice and scammers that are just coming through. And that's particularly difficult when we have as many seniors as we do, when we have hurricanes coming through and everybody's feeling desperate. So we're going to hammer down on that. And, sir, that's going to be a priority because that's a very local issue, and it goes on all over this state. Thank you. Follow-up, yes. Just really call, to follow up with that, it's already been filed in the House on my end. So we took the last year's bill, we drilled down on it, we made it specific uh, to take it away from, from the general contractors and the contractors that actually are doing business the right way, and we've, we've narrowed the scope. So it's already been filed on the House, and so uh, I'm waiting to see what that rough draft version looks like. Uh, I'll review it with the Senator and, and then uh, gain his support, and he'll, he'll probably submit that to the Senate. Thank you. Our next question also from Patricia Spear for Representative Sullivan. What is your highest priority for the next legislative session? Thank you. Well, my highest priority this year in education is to do something specifically for our teachers. Ideally, hopefully that will be a salary raise. I know that they would appreciate that, and that's something that I'm supportive of. Um, but I also want to deal with the quality of life within the classroom. I think that there's specifically from the schools that I've visited and the conversations I've had, that there's been a lot of continuing education requirements put on teachers for a lot of different things. And I'm sure over the years they individually had good intentions, but I think they've been very cumulative. And I think what I would love to see is giving teachers the opportunity to own their personal development and where their weaknesses are in the classroom and have the option to choose continuing education or workshops or whatnot that they would be able to specifically gain strength in these areas where they feel weak, where they could be better set up for success. I think it's one thing to try to pay someone more and that's a very important part of the conversation. But alongside that, I think you need to look at the quality of life and letting them actually teach again. And um, so we're always looking at the regulations on teachers. I've already actually met with um, a person from the unions. And we're working on points that we could agree with together of what different regulations that are burdensome for teachers could be removed. And so I would say anything within that scope, and if you're a teacher here tonight, I welcome your feedback and ideas because we're definitely in the early stages of that. But I would love to improve the quality of life for our teachers in Lake County and across the state. And that's going to be a crucial element to teacher retainment because we all know um, we're desperately hurting to retain our teachers. Um, and it's far easier to keep a good teacher than to go recruit a brand new one. And so I think that we need to be spending time on both. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Patty Winston. Our founding fathers did not foresee back in the 1700s modern assault-style weapons. What are your reasons for not supporting a ban? Specifically, do you favor closing the Charleston loophole? And, and for the panel, I'll say we have had a question on the ban, but not everyone had an opportunity to weigh in, and this is asking for reasons to support or not. So I'm going to open it up to the panel. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, I believe that the Constitution that's being pushed right now is actually going to fail in the courts. Uh, our Attorney General Ashley Moody is challenging it right now because it's so broadly and vaguely defined. There is no such thing as an assault rifle. Assault is something a person does, not an inanimate object. And so what we need to do is really take a closer look at what's, stem, what's stemming these issues, which is mental health, alienation in modern society, and we can go on talking about that. But in terms of the gun ban, totally do not support that. You'll be shocked to know that most of these weapons are very, very similar to what you consider normal weapons. Uh, you always hear the slogan in the media, weapons of war. Every weapon that they want to ban, including a pistol used in the war. I qualify on a pistol in the Florida Army National Guard. So uh, the answer is no in the law. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the next question from Eileen Rand. If you believe in the rights of the unborn child, what services are you going to provide and what funds are you going to commit to after the child is born? The current administration is cutting or eliminating funds and services to help families. How will you help these families who need help with these children? Well, first thing, you've got you to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, and that's the reason that's a good question. And the first thing I said to myself after having three wonderful young men, my wife and I prayed about it and said, we have to do something about these kids who don't have parents. And we got involved with foster care. We had a number of foster kids. 
and uh, adopted two of them. Jeffrey's blind and brain damaged and has been with me since age eight. Yes, I've spent a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of our hearts. And my wife's done 90% of the work, and I can't think of anything more important that taught me the value of every single child. Not only did we get him, but because we had Jeff at eight months of old, and by the way, he's now 32, and he's quite a remarkable young man. Not only did we get him, but we get after they were released on the shaken baby case, they called me and said, how would you like to have a little girl? Because this little girl cannot go there. Six days old, after four boys, I said, well, yeah, after all these boys, about time we had a little girl around here. And God has blessed us. Ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. You can interrupt you. Well, I let them finish. Follow up questions point, can't be written. Thank you. My point is saying that's hands on. Communities have to engage, individuals have to engage. That everything is a government program is not the solution. But yes, we do a lot for children. You should see the numbers that we pour into the, the child area to make sure kids have a chance. And I'm, I'll back up to no one that we don't really fully invest, and many of us invest our lives. But it's going to take more to see about the future than complain about the government. We have to personally, as communities and individuals, step up. And that's the difference and the efficiency and the depth with which that problem is met is so much more real when communities of faith and individuals will do more than just take them to fill out some government forms. But get involved in their lives and help meet these issues. We just had a community of faith here not too long ago right here locally that paid a whole bunch of people's medical bills for them. There are ways that we can get involved besides saying the government should do it. It's one of the most inefficient ways to solve all these problems. Yes, we have a hand in it. Yes, we need to facilitate. And I will commit to vote for those resources that get these things accomplished. But I won't vote for programs that don't work. And I will not let us off the hook and say, we as individuals, what am I doing to help a child besides complaining about the government? Thank you. I will add, I think life is so vitally important to be protected from conception till natural death. And I think that there are multiple different programs, specifically um, one of the ones that's even here in this community, the Community Health Center in Leesburg and Tavares. Um, and they also have one in Apopka, which is part of my district. But they're actually a federal program that offers assistance. They have OB care and they have full care for a child all the way up till 18 years of age and then moving into the primary care space. So they have great resources. We have resources in our office that we can get if there's anyone in the room that needs more information about that. Also, from a state standpoint, we have the Healthy Start Kids, which is part of the state Medicaid program. Um, there's the Florida Health Department that offers resources. There's crisis pregnancy centers that offer resources. And there's another, um, lots of other nonprofit organizations that offer offer resources and um, I think I mentioned crisis pregnancy centers but I would just like to say too if anyone finds themselves in that situation and needs any more information on that I'd be happy to partner with you in um, building bridges and relationships and making sure that you have the resources that you need and then also in addition to foster care there's always the option of adoption um, which I know of several people who would be interested in pursuing that as well so please let me know if I can assist you in that. Thank you. And at this moment, as the moderator, just again to remind everyone, uh, we are taking written questions. They can still be submitted, including follow-up questions, and those are done in the back of the room. So you do have time to get in additional questions, or if you've joined us uh, in the last several minutes. Moving on, our next question comes from Linda Kiro. She asks, will you support the intention of House Bill 45, which would require private voucher schools to comply with discriminatory practices? I haven't read the bill, so I can't give you a yes or no, but here's my initial impression. The hit job that was done by the Orlando Sentinel on the existing law in Florida saying that these, that these charter schools are discriminating against kids based on their sexuality, there's no evidence of it. It's completely and totally made up. Crazy Scott Maxwell, whose readership is probably like 50 people, went and told everybody 
that there was all this discrimination, but when he was asked about the discrimination, he couldn't bring up a single specific example of discrimination in the charter schools. It doesn't exist. So this is what we're at now. This is where we're at on site, where they're just making things up and pretending that there's all these travesties happening somewhere and we need all this immediate reaction, but it doesn't exist. So if the bill says what I think it's going to sell, no, say no, I'm going, to, I'm going to vote against it because I try to support bills that have a positive impact, not ones that just speak to pretend problems. Okay. Moving on to our next question from Stuart Clapp. Florida has the 17th largest economy in the world and the third largest economy in the country. Why is support for public education so low? I'd say the support for public education isn't low. Every year that I've been in the legislature, and this is my fifth session, we continue to fund it at a greater amount. Now, I think in every silo, there are people that are going to want more money to be spent there. Um, in Lake County specifically, we brought back for the best and brightest um, retention, re it's re help retain teachers and reward teachers that are excelling um, four million two hundred and seventy three thousand dollars here in Lake County alone. For safe schools allocation we brought back over two million six hundred and fifty six thousand and for mental health funding in our Lake County schools we brought back one point one million dollars. So we're continuing to fund and like I said I think specifically we need to be paying teachers more but I think that to do that, we have to look at where we can come back. And part of that, hopefully, based on what Representative Sabatini mentioned and some of the health care initiatives we passed this year and lowering the cost of care, um, our health insurance rates will go down. The amount of money we're paying into Medicaid will go down. And we'll have more money to spend on education um, to help our students and to give teachers um, the wage that's really more of a livable wage. Our next question comes from Iris Hagney. She says, are, you, are the representatives familiar with Florida Statute 723, the Florida Mobile Home Act? And are you aware that the act is written to favor mostly the corporate park owners over the residents who are primarily elderly residents on fixed incomes? Well, we have some wonderful people that live in mobile homes, and they are in great suspended animation sometimes as to what's going to happen with these parks. Uh, I've worked ever since I've been there closely with the uh, Mobile Homeowners Association. And this is the thing where you have to bring the players and find the right balance. Uh, the statute is not, I, I don't share the view, that, I, that really was a negotiated statute that we operate under. But there's new dynamics that people bring to the equation and there's things that try to get pulled that we do have people that live in uncertainty. This is not an easy subject because you have property rights of the owners of their mobile homes and you also have property rights of the park, park owners and when they exchange hands sometimes the relationships are different. This is going to have, it is accelerating to a point of crisis again that, that needs to be renegotiated and that would be my approach is you've got to get park owners who have property rights and also uh, mobile homeowners who have rights and work out the situation. The most egregious situations that I've had a hard time getting a hold of is because they know kind of right where the skinny line is and uh, they actually intimidate the park uh, residents into agreeing to something that they should, probably shouldn't have agreed to and, uh, and kind of get them caught in a catch-22 where they feel they have no choices and they don't know where they're going. So this is an ongoing saga that I think has reached another pitch point that says it's time to reevaluate what's been done, renegotiate with both sides of this equation. Look, park owners need, need the uh, residents to succeed and the residents need uh, legitimate park owners that care about these residents to be successful what they do. So there is a common interest and a common threat if we can help them find it. And I pretty well force them to come to the table and work with each other and make an agreement that is fair to both rather than uh, saying these people lose and these people win. Thank you. Our next question comes from Darwin Baston. As a representative of several communities surrounding Tavares, what is your view of the city of Tavares borrowing $20 million to build a 300-seat performing arts center? 
Should that be the business of the city, or should it be left to nonprofits or the for-profit community? I represent Tavares. I would say that I think it's important to look at the role of government. So I don't find the role of government to include competing with other businesses and creating um, certain things that would be at the expense of the taxpayers that don't necessarily want to continue to pay into that. So I think if there's a community that there's general consensus that they're the ones being taxed, they live within the city and that's what they want, then they can certainly pursue that. That's the community they're living in and they have a local voice. However, I think as beautiful as the Tavares Pavilion is on the lake, I think it, it does genuinely compete with other business. And so I think there's a role to play in that. And I think I love the idea of partnerships when the city partners, partners with businesses and helps them thrive and they work together to revitalize a town and a city. And I love what Tavares has created here. I think we all love this community and what they've done with the seaplane theme, the businesses they brought in and whatnot. But I do think that you have to look at what is the role of government? Does this fall within the role? Because it really should be a very narrow scope. And when it grows, then it also oftentimes doesn't do what it's intended and what its role is well because it spread itself too thin and there's not money to do it all. So I would tend to take that approach. Uh, I think that's a very good summary. The, my situation is I, I don't want to interfere in local governments. If they can work out, that's a local decision and it's very live right now because you can, you've got some council seats coming up and you can demonstrate where you are on this. But uh, our biggest concern, I, I, I've sat on the Committee for Oversight and Accountability, and I have I don't see this in my district right now. We have a lot of conscientious people, but you can get that way at any point. And the key is, are they doing responsible things on behalf of the taxpayers? We charter the communities the way our structure of government is. The state charters these communities, and we do, at the request of the voters, often audit them. And I've seen some terrible messes where a string of bad decisions were made. So I applaud you for entering this conversation. Um, I'm sure it's all well-intentioned and there's some beautiful dreams. But sometimes jobs, government's leaders' jobs is to say, no, this isn't the right time or the right way. And, uh, and it's time for you to have that conversation with them. Are you, where do you want to be? Uh, but I have every conviction that to varies with all the success you've had, We'll work this out with the communities. So whether this is the thing to do or not, I have great confidence in you, and you'll have some great leaders to speak to to understand both sides, the side of uh, financial accountability over the long haul, and also the folks that want to see this uh, community be a flourishing, wonderful place to visit. There's a good balance there to be had, and uh, you've got some good choices right now running that can help you make that choice. Thank you. Our next question comes from Terry Stevens. Veteran teachers have been losing $6,000 a year plus cost of living. When do you plan on addressing this issue with the continuity and shortage of teachers? We have talked about education spending, but as it relates directly to teacher salaries and retention, I think we'll open it up to the group. I'm not quite sure where we're coming from with the losing $6,000 a year. I don't know if that was a previous bonus that's no longer being received or if that has to do with moving schools or positions. So I'd be happy to follow up with the individual um, afterwards. But I know one of the big issues was with Best and Brightest, teachers that couldn't qualify because one of the main requirements was their SAT score. And so after talking with a lot of teachers, and personally I was one of two Republicans only one of two Republicans that voted against Best and Brightest the very first time because I didn't like that I had the SAT requirement and then when I became chair, I took it out of there. So Best and Brightest doesn't look at your SAT score, it looks at what you're doing in the classroom now, which I think is most important, what you're doing right now today in your classroom. Um, so again, I'm not sure where the losing 6000 a year is coming from, that's not something I've heard before, but I certainly would love to hear more about it, so please see me after the town hall. Our next question comes from Rod Olson to Representative Sullivan. How does one effectively address the school overcrowding in Orange County Public Schools? 1,972 portables do not provide the same level of safety and security to our children. Again, we've touched on education funding. If 
you have anything you want to add on maybe PICO or school construction, um, but we'll, we'll move through this one pretty quick. Absolutely. So what I will say to that is specifically the overcrowding that's occurring in Apopka is a big issue. Um, Melissa Bird was recently elected as a school board member for that area to represent, and she's been working with the Orange County School Board um, to get the school moved sooner because it was in the five-year plan to build another one in Apopka. Now um, they're going to be starting on it now, starting in the blueprint phase, and hopefully we'll start building within the next two years. So that's expedited by three years. Obviously, long term, we know the portables are a viable solution. Um, but we've recognized that need with all the incoming people that have been moving into our community. And so we are working with that. And tomorrow I have a meeting with the entire Orange County School Board, all of the members. Um, and I know that's one of the things we'll be discussing. Okay. Our next question comes from Vance Jakayan. Uh, it's a two-part question panel, so I'll read both parts. Number one, explain the controversy over city home rule and your stand on it. Number two, cities like Tavares, Claremont, etc., are steamrolling unincorporated, unincorporated areas and approving and by annexing and approving high density developments. That destroys their dream home rural area. What is the solution, or should we just warn rural buffers of the dangers? So I'm going to repeat the question. Rural buyers. Uh, it's a very good question because when you're in the path of progress and growth and prospering, these are the kinds of issues. But believe me, no growth problems are much worse. There's no money to do anything or fix anything or make anything better. And so a modest amount of appropriate growth, we're right in the stream of it, and this is some of the challenge that you face. And as I say, I do respect local government. I'm a former mayor myself of a little town of 3,000 people. Uh, and we struggled with these very things. It was the city of Bellevue, just north of here. And uh, I was very young at the time. It was back in 82. And I can tell you this, uh, as I looked at how fast we're developing and previous developing communities behaved around us, around the state, what I realized that if smaller communities don't annex, they will lose control of what happens. It's going to happen anyway, and it's going to run over them without that. So it requires collaboration, particularly like a district like ours. We, we have like 20 communities, so they all have different ways of meeting this problem, and they all have different identities, and that's okay. There are some things that we have to preempt because it's just a, a complete patchwork of mess to do anything statewide or if you do business in a number of communities or counties. And so it's a balancing act of how to have that together. But uh, I do think it's worthy to do that kind of planning and think about annexation. Uh, we've actually done a great job in this part of Florida because we have probably a third of the properties of this region are publicly held. We're not going to overdevelop. A third of it will never be developed. It will protect. This is lakes, rivers, streams, um, national forests. We have a lot of land that is under preservation and control. We've got about a third developed that we're reworking, and you're seeing that. All of these communities are re-flourishing as Florida flourishes. And at the same time, you do have these things to look at. How do we manage that other section of how do we develop it appropriately so that it, we don't lose those things we love dearest? And I'm a fifth generation Floridian. There's a lot I love. But at the same time, though, it's healthy that would be able to feed our people and they'd be able to take care of their own families and that they have things that they would have never had. So I think you're, it's hard work, but I think you're actually doing it very well. And you should give yourself a pat on the back once in a while. We are winning a lot of things. Okay. Our next question comes from Robert Morin. What is your impression of last Saturday's march, Unite for What's Right? Would you support relocating the statue to Tallahassee, Florida, a history museum, or a Confederate exhibit? Open question. Representative Seventeen. I think it's alarming that the Bolsheviks who organized the uh, censorship march last Saturday, that want to shut down and destroy American history, they want to eliminate statues, they want to take inanimate objects and parade and get unrestful. Here's what's important. There's 360, there's 360 
360,000 people uh, in Lake County. So that makes 359,900 uh, that weren't there. And so really, it's a, it, I'm shocked by how few people were there. Most of them were probably from Orange County. And uh, they, they, it's, we shouldn't be marching into history museums and saying that we need to eradicate and destroy all of these objects that may or may not hurt, hurt somebody. Uh, and so that, you know, hurts somebody's feelings. And so I, I think that's sad. I think it's the wrong approach. And uh, it, it's just, it's just, it really is embarrassing that that's where we are now. Censorship's even a topic. Uh, well, I, I really think it's time for communities to develop a mutual respect. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person. Okay, Ladies we're not doing a dialogue here. You're right. I'm answering your question. Okay. He was disrespectful. Well, that, he stopped me. Stay out of my conversation. I won't be responding. I did. Let me explain please, something. To please recall the rules of decorum. Thank you. Let me explain what went on in the Senate. I voted for the for the bill that would place Ms. Bethune in a place of honor. I graduated from Maine High School and my travels around the state at growing up. And I knew what a great woman she was and what a great story she has. I voted for that bill. But you know what? I also voted for it because in that same bill, it says that the artifact of this general that stood as an artifact for over 100 years, or right at 100 years representing Florida, be brought back and placed in a place of dignity. And that's what I want. I want us to respect each other. I don't destroy anybody else's monuments. I've been 50 years in funeral service. Desecrating other people's memorials that were placed in honor, I think we owe them some kind of respect for the leadership they brought in their time. And we can also learn from history, the good and the bad and the ugly. And we did learn that. And we are a different country. But I also would defend with my life your right to express your opinion and demonstrate. But I will tell you that we will be better off when we learn to respect that there's so much more we can do to help people if we would quit drawing these lines. And um, quite frankly, there's a lot of people still here that you have to remember soldiers serve and protect. And a lot of them simply were protecting their homes from being burned down, their families. The way that all worked out, it was a very, very hard time with families. And so I, I just pray that we work through this and that you can respect that we all have history. And let's build more monuments to more people. I voted for this, the monument to those who endured slavery. Those people built the state. And they deserve honor. But there's one race, and that's the human race. And we need to learn how all to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We're going to move on. Uh, we still have several questions to get to you. Of course, we're going to respect all of everyone's time. So our next question comes from Peter Carcillo. Uh, In the Heller decision, Justice Scalia wrote that the right to bear arms is not absolute. It can be limited by legislation. This puts our rights at risk. Will you commit to protect our rights to carry any weapon of any capacity to protect our freedom? Thank you. Panel, we've had several questions on gun policy and assault weapons bans, so I'm going to call this duplicative, and we're going to move forward. Our next question uh, from Vance Boheme. Uh, Yoakum. Sorry, I thought I was butchering someone's name. Uh, for all members of the panel, there is no transparency over budgets over, over budgets and performance metrics for constitutional officers like the sheriff. They are not required to have public budget hearings, to post proposed or approved detailed budgets, or to have periodic performance audits to evaluate efficiency and effectiveness. What can you do to improve their budget transparency and public oversight? Representative 17. I filed a bill last year that I think would have brought the very bipartisan, normal sense of transparency that people expect. When I was a city commissioner, we had great budgets. And uh, if you look at a city or county budget, what you'll see is that uh, it's very easy to access the information of what that city or county is doing this year, last year, etc. 
Doesn't mean it's perfect, it'd always be better, but it's pretty good. I was shocked actually to find that constitutional officers don't have a lot of the same budgetary requirements and that the citizens themselves really don't know how to get the information they want outside of a traditional public records request, a legal mechanism. So I followed a bill that would have required more transparency to their budgets. All the constitutional officers, the majority of them, uh, worked with me on the bill and uh, were supportive of it. Didn't make it across the finish line. I had some enemies. Not everybody likes that additional scrutiny. But I plan on filing it uh, sometime in the near future, maybe again this year. But I do believe that uh, Mr. Yoakum's question gets to an important issue. We need more transparency, and we probably need some performance standards and metrics that are uh, necessarily applied to constitutional officers. I, and that's not a bad thing. These constitutional officers are doing, most of the time, a very good job. And I think it's important citizens understand uh, how good they do with the limited resources they have. And so that's what the bill would have done, just put more light on that. Mr. Yogelman, if you give me a third shot, I'll get it right, I promise. No, that's enough. <laughs> Next question is from Ralph Smith. Being that the governor, when campaigning, voiced his support for a heartbeat bill, will you address President Galvano, Speaker Oliva, or the appropriate committee chair on putting one before the governor to sign, thereby allowing him to keep his promise to protect unborn babies from unnecessary pain? And what bill do you personally prefer? I filed this bill in the Senate, and it was part of a national discussion. Over 15 states were considering, um, particularly after what New York and uh, Virginia did as a statement about their view. And um, it was rather shocking for many of us uh, that we really are into the area of infanticide. My view on this, I wish we didn't need any laws, but the fact is we have to protect every single life, no matter how old or how young. And that's one of the primary roles of government. I filed this bill because I thought we should be a part of that national discussion. I didn't know if it was the time was right or if the wording was right. But surely, in a civilized society, there's a better way to deal with unplanned pregnancy than simply destroying 60 million infants. And can't we have a discussion about what is good for women, and how many women feel abused by the present process that we hear from also. Um, so it is very touching, it's very sensitive. As a father of five, as an adoptive father, eight grandchildren, I think about how our policies will affect my five little granddaughters. Um, what are we saying? And how do we say it in a better way that's more compassionate? Um, that bill had 10 co-sponsors. Um, it uh, did not move in the House. I did have a commitment from the Health Care Committee that she would hear it if it moved in the, in the House. But in, in the Senate, uh, it was not heard in committee. Uh, we do have about five states that did pass something along that line. And so someone is already testing this out in the court system. These kind of things, you know, are all going to be ultimately deliberated in court. Uh, we have another issue in Florida that I think is very significant that I think we can come together on. Um, I probably will not file that again this year because I'm not sure the timing is right. We've already got other states in the process of testing that concept. Heartbeat was a great message because people understood that. And when, you, when someone has a heartbeat, they're still alive. And so um, that, that communicated something that I thought was important to discuss. And, and surely, we, we, we need to look at what are the long-term implications of the present policies we have around this topic. But I will tell you, there is a bill that Senator Stargell is filing again that I think we very much should pass. And we should focus there right now, and that is uh, parental consent. Right now in Florida, a minor can't get a tattoo without parental consent. They can't pierce their ears without parental consent. They can't get an aspirin at school without parental consent. Yet with the bypass of parental notification that we have, they could take one of my granddaughters to a pregnancy uh, clinic, well, whatever they call these abortion clinics, and next phone call, my son or daughter might get, my son might get is she's in the emergency room hemorrhaging. She doesn't even know they did it invasive medical procedure on their own child. This is not good policy. On parental rights alone, this is not good policy.
And I don't think it's an accurate interpretation of the Privacy Clause of the Constitution. And so I hope you'll think very seriously about that, wherever you are on this issue. The fact is, that is taking parents out of the picture at the very time they should be there. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Per our rules, we do have the option for additional follow-up. We'll move on to the next question. So, Representative Mike Hill filed that in the House last year. I co-sponsored it. It didn't get any legs last year. Um, we, we put forth the efforts, we just couldn't get any movement. So we'll see if it comes about this uh, again this year. And certainly if it does, I'll be a part of that. I will add to that. Sure. In the parental consent bill, it made it um, all the way through all the House committees and passed the House floor. Um, and so I'm hoping we'll have the Senate support we need this year to get it over the finish line, because um, that one is really important as well. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kim Norberg to the whole panel. Will you support ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment in Florida? My view is that's very seventy-ish. We've already have equal rights. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Equal. I would say I'm on record saying that I wouldn't only because I think our Constitution does give rights to people. And the more and more that you chip away and create different subgroups of people, I think you take away everybody's rights. I think everybody has value. Everybody, the fact that they are a mere human being and walking on this earth should be treated with respect, dignity, their value should be um, respected and they should be treated well. So I don't care where you come from, what you look like, who you are, what your persuasion is, I think everyone should be treated with dignity and respect. Yeah, I'm against it. It would actually hurt women because it, it makes it more difficult to pay a woman more than a man in some instances. And so it's, it's really actually not good for women. And women, uh, we're at a, a point in society where women are advancing at an increasing rate better than men. They're, they're, more, they're getting more educated. They will be paid more in a moment in time. So by the time that bill got, became law in a ways, it would be against the interest of women. We're going to move on to the next question from Darwin Basin. Last week, a couple in their mid-70s in Washington State committed a murder-suicide because they could not afford the cost of their health care. <laughs> the cost of health care for a 65-year-old couple for the remainder of their lives is in excess of $285,000. What are you doing or should we do to help seniors with the high cost of health care? <laughs> we spoke about the... Uh, very, very, very high cost in, uh, uh, of the delivery of healthcare and the artificial conditions that have basically created that horrible situation. And I just want to take this opportunity to talk about one more bill that I really wish would have passed that Florida House this year. I know it'll be filed again next year. It's a, it's a bill that allows skilled nurse practitioners more uh, uh, responsibility in the, in the healthcare situation. We need to get behind let these nurses to do what they do to the extent of their training. And so that bill passed the House died in the Senate, unfortunately, but I know that the senior leadership of the House, which has the best interests of Florida and their, the cost of their health care in mind, will follow that bill again and push that bill again, and I guarantee that that will reduce the cost of health care. Next question comes from Elizabeth Emery. What policies or bills would you support to change the way we evaluate and recruit quality teachers, as well as how we evaluate and grade public schools? We've already uh, discussed teacher recruitment Anything on maybe testing or school grades? I think we've covered the education topics. I would, I would, just, sure. add, I would just add to that, that when I did my round circles with teachers in Lake County schools, I have four left that I'm doing in October. So if you are in Umatilla Middle or High School or Eustis um, Middle or High School, I haven't made it to you yet. Um, but I look forward to having the conversation. And I would say the general consensus in the room was everybody agreed that they wanted to be paid more. But when I ask, well, how specifically do you want that pay to be distributed? Do you want it to be based on how many years you've been serving? Do you want it to be based on your students' test scores? Because everyone comes from a different home, so you could be teaching to the best of your ability. That doesn't mean everybody's going to have high test scores. Do you want it to be based on the credentials that you have, based on your education yourself? 
Um, or do you want it to be based on the subject matter that you're teaching? I think there's so many different variables that go in with it, and nobody really had a straight answer for me. And so to that I would say, I welcome your perspective. I welcome your ideas of what that could look like, because I think the conversation is always around it needs to be more, but what should that look like? I don't think that um, a room of lawmakers in Tallahassee should make that decision, apart from the teachers in our, in our classrooms having that conversation. So that's why I'm trying to go to you and visit these different schools and have those conversations, conversations, but I look forward to hearing your perspective. Okay. Our final question of the evening from Ralph Smith. Uh, in, two, in 2015, according to the CDC, there were six times per capita the amount of abortions of unborn black babies than, than white babies. Would you support identifying Planned Parenthood as a hate group, being they are the largest practitioner of this practice? We address the abortion issue, so I'm going to flag this as duplicative, and then we're going to proceed now to the closing comments portion. Ladies and gentlemen, please. You've been great so far. We're going to land the plane on time. And so we're going to go ahead to our panel of legislators and open it up for a two-minute closing statement. Once again, I really appreciate you guys being out here tonight. Active Citizen Tree is extremely important, and you guys have done a great job. I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce my wonderful fiance, Francesca Marcus, who's here with me tonight. Thank you, Francesca, for coming. I love Lake County. Uh, I've lived here my whole life. I plan on living here for a long time longer, raising my kids here, my grandkids, great grandkids, and thankfully for term limits, I will not have to serve that entire time. Uh, there was a question. <laughs> There was a question that another member got earlier, and I wish I got it, which is said, what was the bill that you want to see passed this year uh, or work on? The one bill I want to see passed is that skilled nurse practitioner bill. I think that's imperative. Uh, but the one that I'll file and that I'm passionate about is one that passed the House, but we didn't get it through the Senate, and I think it's something that Floridians should have the opportunity to vote on, and that's school board term limits. I believe every elected official should be term limited. I believe we need fresh new faces in local government and all levels of government. And I think we need people to step up and get involved. One of the people uh, signify me as, a, a, I think, a, a pretty heavy critic of local government. I am just as suspicious of the federal or state government as I, as I am local. I've experienced local government more. But the, one of the things that I think... Uh, uh, puts me in that position as I don't see enough of the citizens stepping up to run for office. I hate seeing somebody run for office and no one runs against them. Uh, it's been, it happens all the time in local government. We need competition. We need citizens stepping up and providing public service by running for office. So I encourage every single person in this room, uh, even the Democrats, to run for office. Run for office. We have 14 cities in Lake County. We have a water authority that needs elected officials. So please, everybody get involved. Thank you guys for the opportunity to be here tonight. It's been a pleasure listening and learning and listening to my colleagues. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my wife of 22 years. Her name is Candace, and she is the backbone to uh, everything I do. So I'm thankful for that. My son's 18, named Cooper. We're taking him to college on Thursday. He's the only child we have, so it's an emotional time in our family, but we're, we're thankful to continue to serve you folks. Uh, we won't compromise. You're not going to get that with me. So what you see is what you get, and, uh, and I'm proud to be that person. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight and for those who participated in submitting questions and continuing the conversation. I look forward to doing that. I want to take a moment to thank my staff, Sarah Lynn Ard, my legislative aide, if you'll stand up, and Aileen Guy, if you'll stand up, my district aide. They, thank you. They went to great lengths to help organize tonight um, and make it a reality to the members and also Chris, who stepped in last minute to be our moderator and our timekeeper as well. Thank you to um, the men in uniform and the black for being here and for your service to our community. I appreciate you. And again, thank you guys for being out here on a Tuesday night and being engaged in the process. You know, I think what wasn't covered tonight is the fact that we live in exciting times. And in the Florida legislature this year, we accomplished great things. We had a record number of funding in education. We had landmark policy and school choice. We had an incredible 
um, policy package come out in regards to our waterways in the state of Florida. DeSantis has been a huge champion for cleaner water, uh, fixing the Everglades and having sustainable solutions, and Lake County is a huge part of that. We got over $2 million in Lake County to clean up some of the hydrilla issues here that we have going on. Um, we had record numbers in affordable housing because we recognize that's a huge issue. Really excited about what Lake County's doing here, coming together to try to help some of the homeless in our community. Um, and we also did a great deal for business owners. We continued to lower the business rent tax. We had our weekend long um, school tax holiday that we just experienced. We also have our hurricane preparedness tax relief that we offered. So there's a lot we're doing in the state of Florida. We had a record session again under the leadership of Governor DeSantis and in the Senate. I think the House and Senate worked together in some of the best ways that I've seen in five years. And so that is so exciting. It's such an honor to have the privilege to represent you. I know a lot of us in the room have differing opinions, but I want to know that I appreciate you coming out and being a part of the conversation because that's how we grow. That's how um, we're the best that we can be. And um, um, my office doors are always open. We do monthly, if not bi-monthly, um, constituent meetings. So feel free to bring your other ideas. And to give you a little perspective on the timeline of things, September starts our committee weeks. We'll have committees in September, October, November, December. Session starts in January, and that 60-day session will go to the end of March. So, again, thank you for having um, the opportunity to represent you. Thank you. Henry Ford had a quote, I used it so often, my kids put it on a plaque, and it's, don't find fault, find a remedy. I don't, I don't need to know who to blame, I need to know what can we do to make it better, and work together to, to find those things. And I want to tell you, Lake County, you actually do that. We all have the flashpoints and the things that set us off, but the fact is, we really come together and solve a lot of problems and challenges for the future. The main reason I ran for the Florida Senate is... With five kids and eight grandkids, I look at that picture every day. I think, what kind of America, what kind of place, Florida, am I giving them and their generation? I know what we got. A place of opportunity. A place where an ordinary kid can start out mowing the yard at the funeral home and wind up being able to build a business, go to college, on my own. Nobody paid my bills. Because I was taught the, the great things that we have right here in America to work with, just to get here, is so awesome. And I don't want them to lose that. And I don't want us to lose that. I'm very proud of the school board here and the advances that have been made. Look, when I came to the Florida Left House, we were looking at 60% graduation rates in a lot of places. Now you got schools that are doing 80 something percent graduation rates. When I see this shift towards relevance, that we're giving people real employable skills and certifications, making it relevant that education is not something different than doing well in life, but it's a pathway and the best tool forward. It's powerful. And you taxpayers, you are investing more in education than in any other single subject. It's the biggest part of your tax bill. Yes, it's huge. There will never be enough money for all the challenges and potentials that lie in such a gigantic problem, a challenge for the future. But you're winning. You're winning. You're seeing kids have more choice, more options to find a way to do well. And, and I think teachers, they're doing a great job. If it wasn't for committed teachers, I didn't teach anybody to read this year. A lot of you did. So celebrate the victory. Celebrate the excitement of the opportunities that we have. And yes, it's all right to question the things that we're doing. But also, take time to choose joy and be grateful. We live in the greatest part of Florida, in the greatest state, in the greatest country, in the world. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Now, as, as, we, as we close this evening, please join me in thanking our panel of legislators for their time tonight. For that session. And again, to you all, thank you for your engagement tonight. Thank you for your ability and your questions, and we look forward to seeing you next year.